Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Theology on Homosexuality podcast and the Torch Leadership Foundation Institute's inaugural edition of the Heal Lutzer McKissick Lecture Series. This lecture series is in honor of Pastor E.V. Heal, Pastor Erwin Lutzer, and Pastor Dwight McKissick, men of God who have stood for God, truth, and righteousness down through the years without compromise for the glory of God. My name is Daniel White the Third, President of Gospel Light Society International. And this podcast was created primarily to inform the Christian church about why it must stand against homosexuality, homosexual marriage, homosexual parenting, and the homosexual agenda. The biblical portrait of marriage, family, and sexuality has unfortunately come under attack in our society, and it is time for the church to stand up and to educate our culture about the dangers of same-sex marriage and the same-sex agenda, while at the same time to promote God's idea of marriage between one man and one woman. God's view of the family structure and God's view of sexuality as being permissible and pleasurable within the safety and sanctity of marriage. The normalization of homosexuality and everything that pertains to it is probably the greatest danger facing our world today. Thus, it is imperative that the body of Christ choose to stop ignoring this prevailing issue and problem and stand up for what God says on this matter before it completely destroys our country. This podcast and lecture series is designed to equip pastors, church leaders, and Christians everywhere to take a firm stand for God against homosexuality, homosexual marriage, and the homosexual agenda. In the spirit of love, grace, and truth, so that we will not be responsible for allowing this nation to implode on our watch. Our theology on homosexuality passage from the Word of God today is Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. It reads, If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Allow me to share with you some important points and thoughts regarding this passage from the David Guzik commentary on the Bible. Though God here commanded the death penalty for homosexual practice under the guidelines of evidence in a capital case, as described in Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 and 7. We should note this was not a more severe punishment than what was commanded for adultery or incest. Homosexuality is sin, but sin in the same sense other sexual sins are. Our theology on homosexuality quotes today are from Dwight McKissick and Maggie Gallagher. Dwight McKissick said, There is one major personality and three-dimensional system of government 
that has not yet signed off on the sociological uh, people group in America, that is gay Americans, homosexual Americans, the one major personality who has not signed off on nor endorsed this behavior is the one who created all people, God Almighty, the three-dimensional form of government that has not approved of same-sex relationships and homosexuality is the Trinitarian enterprise, until God Almighty and the Trinitarian Enterprise change their position on this subject, there is a remnant of us who refuse to change also. We are commanded to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. God said that his word is forever settled in heaven. Therefore, his word on this subject is not going to change. Neither will kingdom citizens. Maggie Gallagher said, We have not always been so woefully dependent upon the sexual act itself. Two hundred years ago, for example, homosexuality did not exist. There was sodomy, of course, and buggery, and fornication, and adultery, and other sexual sins. But none of these forbidden acts fundamentally altered the sexual landscape. A man who committed sodomy may have lost his soul, but he did not lose his gender. He did not become a homosexual, a third sex. That was the invention of the 19th century imagination. Beloved, our Theology on Homosexuality topic today is titled, The Church Must Speak, Part 2, From the Truth About Same-Sex Marriage. Six things you need to know about what's really at stake by Dr. Erwin Lutzer. And I want to remind you to take advantage of our special offer. If you enjoy this podcast, please feel free to purchase a copy of this book, The Truth About Same-Sex Marriage. Six things you need to know about what's really at stake. It is available on our website, torchleadershipfoundation.com, for just $20. Dr. Irwin Lusa goes on to ask the question, What is a family? What is a family? So why should we be worried? First, we need to realize that in some quarters, a concentrated push to reinvent the family is underway. In October of 2008, a first grade class in San Francisco, California, took a field trip to City Hall to celebrate the wedding of their lesbian teacher, to another woman. In early 2008, in a federal appeals court in Massachusetts, the Parker and Worthland families were told that their local school district was well within its bounds to allow their second grade children to be read a book about homosexual marriage. Tony Perkins of the Family Research Council responded to this ruling by saying, It's amazing how cavalierly the court's decision dismisses 
the evidence that school officials engaged in the deliberate indoctrination of children. The school sought to coerce its students into accepting values that are way outside of the mainstream and in direct contradiction to those of their parents. Yet the same courts that are trying to reinvent the family are encouraging the public schools to act as their surrogate. Gone is the idea that a family should include a mother and a father in a committed relationship rearing their children. Consonant with the notion that I and only I define what's best for me. We are witnessing an effort to redefine family. And because of the prevalence of divorce, serial marriages, and cohabitation, the effort is pretty effective. If marriage is no longer the union of one man and one woman, who is to say that it must be limited to two people? Why not a trio of three men or three women? If we want to find out what might happen now that same-sex marriages are legal in some parts of our country, we need only take a look at what is happening in some countries of Europe right now, where such legislation has existed for a while now. The answer in brief is that the change in laws has in effect wrought the destruction of marriage. In an April 2007 abstract from the World Congress of Families entitled Homosexual Unions, Rare and Fragile, the organization reports, progressive activists in the United States have argued strenuously in recent years that giving homosexuals the legal right to marry will improve life for homosexual couples and will consequently benefit society as a whole. A new study of same-sex marriage in Scandinavia, however, casts serious doubt on such assertions. For as it turns out, relatively few homosexual couples avail themselves of the revolutionary right, and a surprisingly high percentage of those who do so end up in divorce court. Consider these numbers. Between 1993 and 2001, while Norway recorded 196,000 heterosexual marriages, the country witnessed the legal registration of only 1,293 homosexual partnerships. The situation is similar in Sweden, but the most glaring statistic might be the high incidence of divorce among homosexuals in these countries. The divorce rate among male partnerships is 50% higher than that for heterosexual marriages. And the divorce rate among female partnerships is double that of the males. In response to these numbers and the fact that most homosexual couples do not actually get married even when they can, Mark Christopher, author of Same-Sex Marriage, Is It Really the Same?, concludes, Same-Sex Marriage is not about marriage. It is about destroying the traditionally Christian idea of marriage and the family. 
Holy Father God, we pray in the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and we thank you for your mercy and love and grace upon all of us sinners. For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, of your glory. Please forgive us uh, of our sins as Christians and fill us with the fullness and the power of your Holy Spirit as Christians to respond to issues like this in the way that you would. We pray for the salvation of every soul that's lost in sin, no matter what that sin is, for you're not willing that any should perish. And we pray for the salvation of homosexuals. Open their blinded eyes, unstop their deaf ears, and save their souls by the power of your Holy Spirit and by the power of the gospel and by the power of your Holy Word. Glorify your holy name, lift up your holy Son, Jesus Christ, for it is in his name we pray, amen. Now, beloved, before I leave you, if you are listening today and participating today and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, allow me to show you how. First, dear friend, accept the fact that you are a sinner and that you have broken God's law. And so have I. We all have. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Second, accept the fact that there is a penalty for sin. The Bible states in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. Third, accept the fact that you are on the road to hell. That's right. Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10.28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Also, the Bible states in Revelation 21, 8, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, I know this is bad news. But I'm here to tell you, if you live in sin and you never trust Christ as Savior, you're going to spend eternity in hell. I know that that is not popular, but it is true. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ has said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, that is, perish in hell, but have everlasting life. Uh, just believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose from the dead by the power of God for you, so that you can live uh, forever with him. Pray and ask him to come into your heart today to save your soul, and he will save you. Romans 10, 9 through 13 says that if thou, you, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou, you, shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the black and the white, the red and the yellow, the young and the old, the rich and the poor. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Until next time, my beloved. May God bless you and keep you.